Debbie Timmons, what is your favourite game? My favourite game is Grim Fandango. Probably going back to about 1986 or 87 now, when I was six or seven. My dad came home with... We were living in Singapore at the time. I was there for about 15 years. Mm. Um, my dad came home with an Amstrad CPC-64, or possibly a CPC-464. I can never remember. Mm. One of those now ancient green screen things mm. where you put a cassette tape in and it makes horrible, horrible whistling noises. And then, hurrah, a game pops up. <laughs> What game was it exactly, do you know? Oh, oh, well, we had a lot of games, and we had some sort of terrible golf game that I loved. We had Fruity Frank, which my mum absolutely loved. Uh, but I played The Hobbit, mostly, very badly, ah. because uh-huh. it was, well, it was a text adventure. Like, I used to read a lot, and it was a text adventure, but it also had these, like, it would draw these, uh, then, amazingly amazing looking pictures which was like a round hobbit door were there any other games around that time you were in the just um as life w- wore on like all the platforms and games oh yeah i mean I, I mean that's how i started playing games but like then we moved on we got a pen we got a 386 or pentium uh, 486 and we moved on to pentium pc games and yeah i've been playing pc games my entire life as as you were growing up, like within the ninety, like as we started going in the nineties, like what kind of games you were getting into then, like before Grim Fandango. Baldur's Gate was my game of choice in the mid nineties, along with, well, leading up to Grim Fandango, there was all the Lucasfilm games, so Indiana Jones, yeah, and Monkey um, Island, Last Crusade, Monkey Island, exactly. Although I gave up on that with Escape of Monkey Island because the puzzles just got annoyingly ridiculous. Like the memorable part, the part where I just rage quit and went, no, this makes no sense at all, is where I believe you were supposed to stretch a sheet of rubber over a manhole to try and bounce up into the top floor of a house. That was like a perfectly good rubbish bin right next to it. You think, okay, I can stretch a rubbish sheet over a rubbish bin. That makes sense. But how do you stretch a rubbish sheet over a manhole? You don't, right? No. There is nothing to grip on. Exactly, you'd probably have to hold down something strong at the very least, but even then, that's asking, yeah. that's asking a bit too much. Exactly. Whereas things like, you know, making a monkey wrench out of a monkey, okay, mm. it's absurd, but yeah. there's a certain kind of logic there. Whereas this was just the final straw. No, screw you, Monkey Island. No manhole rubber shenanigans for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, before that, that was full throttle, which was absolutely brilliant. Mm. In one of my childhood memories of Video games is setting a a troop of I think was it wind up ducks or wind up rabbits or something. Mm, you had to yeah. send them all plucking along down a minefield to blow up the mines before you could then ride along it. Mm, you're ta- you're talking about a game brilliant. that's probably way before my probably time. Probably came out before you were born, didn't it? Oh my <laughs> god! Hey, I, I'm 91. Remember. That's yeah. that's 1991, by the way, for anyone listening. Not, I'm not actually 91. Um, but like you mentioned, Baldur's Gate. Were you uh, how hard were you in the RPGs at that time, or was it just Baldur's Gate? I played Final Fantasy VIII as well, but I mean, it was very much Bioware for me. So it started with Baldur's Gate. I played a bit of Morrowind, but that came a few years later. Mm, mm. Um, so you're talking Morrowind, about also bloody brilliant. Yeah. But yeah, Baldur's Gate is the one that I played the most. Moved on to Icewind Dale, Baldur's Gate Two, because you had real characters, you know, you actually talk to your party members. Oh, hang on. No, it was Ultima f- Ultima 6, I think, is where I actually got into RPGs. So you were there, like, running around in Britannia, talking to a guy named YOLO and the ranger whose name I can't remember, Dupre, I think. And the interesting thing about the Ultima games was that it wasn't just run around and kill everything in the way that Icewind Dale was. Like, you'd have to go around to all the shrines, and you'd go to the Shrine of Compassion, and then you'd teach the villagers nearby about compassion. And you'd... Ultima 6, I think, had a whole thing with an alternate world of gargoyles, and everybody was basically racist towards the gargoyles, and you had to use the virtues of these shrines to remind people, like, hey, gargoyles are actually kind of awesome. <laughs> They're people, too. <laughs> and it was nice. And yeah, obviously, you ran around and killed stuff as well. Oh, of course. But you did loads of exploring, and... Yeah. yeah, it was lovely. And like you're, you're talking RPGs around 
early, sorry, not early, um, late 90s, early 2000s, like Marvel and like Final Fantasy VIII, at least in Europe, anyways, because I don't think it came out in Europe until 2000. Really? I think so, because... Let me like, check, because I was still in Singapore at the time, which I means late 90s, I think. I'm pretty sure it came out in Asia in 1999, but I'm... Pretty sure it came out in Europe in 2000. Hang on. Oh, uh, yeah, Windows Space Computers 2000. Maybe I played that the year I came back from university then. Oh, I always assumed it came out in 2000 in uh, Europe for PlayStation 1. I always assumed that was the case, but no, you're right. It is, it is January, yeah, that's you. January 2000 uh, for PC. Or February 2000 if you're in Europe. I always assumed it was 1999 in Europe. Yeah. Well, that was the first Final Fantasy I played, so I really like it. I also never finished it, but you know, that's by the by. What do you mean, finish games? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, my, my first proper Final Fantasy for me was, to be frank, 13. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was like pretty excited for it, like pretty excited. So imagine the, um, imagine how let down I was by 13. So Was bad. 13 the one, was that the last one on PS2? No, 13 was the PS3 one. Oh, okay. 13 was the one that went the Xbox 360 for the first time. Mm. 12. Yeah, I never played that one. Uh, I gave up on 12, because 12 was the last one on PS2, and yeah. then when the PS3... I got it just on the cusp of the new generation. Mm. When the PS3 came out, the European version didn't support it did initially. Final Fantasy 12. Oh, oh, that's right, because it was partial backwards compatibility on PS3, but not n- yeah. not all of them, because like, I know... Yeah, and it wasn't on the list. No, because I know the fatty... PS3 supported BC, but like after the slim PS3 came out, they took it out. Mm. So uh, since then, everyone's been going on emulator uh, on PC or PS2 or fatty PS uh, fatty PS3. But um, yeah, Final Fantasy XIV was kind of a letdown for me. For well, not kind of a letdown. It was a letdown for me because like no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't get into it. I even imported the Japanese version like two months before it came out in Europe. Why would you do that if you don't speak Japanese? I don't know. I was excited for it. <laughs> you was... get so excited about things. I know I do, but like I was... you can't get into something when you a story driven RPG when you don't understand the language. But I was still stupidly excited for it. Though. <laughs> like really excited. Like you can ask my former boss, Pat Gar. Like he can tell you firsthand how stupidly excited I was for uh, mm. Final Fantasy fourteen. Like um, I wouldn't stop talking about it. Like uh, before I joined VG twenty four seven permanently. And like I can tell you, the second full day I had a VG24, and that's when uh, that's when I got my copy of the game, and it was like, yes, like a couple of days later. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why were you so excited about it? Like, what what got you thinking this would be a fun thing? <sighs> to be honest, I can't quite remember now why I was so excited for Final Fantasy XIV in the first place. Um, had you played JRPGs before? I played, I can remember playing Ten Two for a bit, and I thought, okay, that was actually kind of alright. But other than yeah, that... Yeah, Ten Two was alright. But other than that, um, no, not really, I don't think, uh, I don't think so. I mean, like, at best, I've played mainly Western RPG, action-based RPGs. Um, actually, no, I do, I, I'm an idiot because I've just remembered Kingdom Hearts 1. Oh, yes. The original Kingdom Hearts, and I, remember loving the shitting hell out of it but at the same time um there was this uh boss fight at the end of the themed level for tarzan uh i can't remember what the name of the boss was but like oh my god even on normal difficulty like you could not beat this guy for a million miles around you unless you like you know grind it so many levels. Oh um, yeah, well that's yeah, that's a JRPG for you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, even still, he was notoriously difficult, and like every time he beat me, and I just heard Sora just Sora's last groan when he died. I just kept chipping the controller on the bed, like hitting it down on the rim of the bed, and I can remember chipping the controller, like part of the controller, and. Uh, each time I banged on the bed or threw the controller up against the wall because of that boss, and it annoyed the hell out of me. <laughs> uh, Damaging your house because of this boss. 
To be honest, I'm not surprised that I'm actually surprised I didn't damage the house, considering how much I was, you know, throwing that controller about the place in sheer frustration. <laughs> uh, that's probably why I've stopped playing Kingdom Hearts 1.5 HD. To be honest. Because you remember how much you hated that. Yeah, and I have um, a copy of um, Final Fantasy XIV as well, waiting to be played on PlayStation 3, because I love what I've played of the, uh, of the beta on PS3 and PS4. And um, I remember getting the PS3 version rather cheaply, but um, for about a fiver, but I can't seem to <coughs> switch it over from PS3 to PS4, because the game bloody won't let me log in to do it. Oh dear. Yeah, so... I'm hopeful of trying to do that before the end of the year because if I don't do it by the end of the year, I've lost my opportunity to play it on PlayStation 4. Oh dear. Oh dear. Yeah, get in there. Like, have you tried checking on the website? I Log ha- it in there. I have, but... Uh, right now, I just can't be arsed because it's so <laughs> frustrating, which is the typical first world problem yeah. as it is but I, I, I I've gotten massively away from the point I've gotten away massively from the point so after around the early 2000s with you know games like Final Fantasy VIII, Moral and what was what was your the rest of your gaming CV like then mm. around the mid 2000s the early two, uh, sorry not early 2000s mid to late 2000s mid to late 2000s I what was I playing oh Gears of War oh Mass Effect because yeah. yeah I missed out almost entirely on the PlayStation 2 generation I was I was a university 2000 well 99 to 2003 and didn't have a TV you know I was staying in halls I was moving around a lot Shared rooms and all that, or shared houses rather, so I didn't actually have time to do much gaming. I played a bit of Command and Conquer, I played Tomb Raider 3 and a bit of Tomb Raider 4, but yeah, moving on to the two- mid 2000s, Mass Effect was the next Bioware RPG mm. after Jade Baldur's Gate 2, and I skipped Jade Empire actually because I didn't have an Xbox. Ah. And I took one look at it, was like, hang on, you can only play one of these three characters, and you have to play with other people. What is this shit? Uh, yeah. Because you didn't, you didn't really have the party system, did you? Mm. As far as I remember. I didn't, haven't played it. I think I've got it on Steam now, I discovered the other day, which surprised me. I don't know when I bought that, but, you know, Steam sales, that's what yeah, happens. I think, I think you do have the party system in Mass Effect 1. Yeah. You do, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no, not Mass Effect. Oh. Uh, Jade what? Empire. Oh, Jade Empire. Oh, sorry if you were Jade Empire on Xbox, I skipped completely. What? I like, never played it. Because, because of this, it seemed like it was designed to, you have your one class and then nobody else seems to really have, well, I don't know. For some reason I didn't like it. Hmm. Well, I certainly wasn't gonna buy an Xbox for it. Ah, uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Put it that way. Um, Especially when I didn't have a TV. But then yes, Mass Effect was, at the time, exclusively on Xbox 360. Yeah. So I went, ah, bollocks, I need to buy an Xbox 360 now. <laughs> like. So I bought that and hmm. learned how to use a controller on Mass on Gears of War. Mm. Like like Gears of War was my first um, foray into the last generation as well. It wasn't just my um, first foray into the last generation. It was my first ever non PlayStation game because like up until 2006, all I'd played was besides a Game Boy Advance, all I'd played was PlayStation games from one through to PSP. Yeah. So Gears of War was my first um, kind of uh, non PlayStation game, so to speak. Um, but Mass Effect, um, Mass, like, Mass Effect is probably not the original Mass Effect, but Mass Effect 2, but I can easily say Mass Effect is probably the best series of RPGs I think I've ever played, at least definitely in terms of the trilogy, and it's the best trilogy I've ever played in, in gaming, easily. Yeah, and in terms of a series, it's got one of the best, the best implementations of story and choice. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And like there's definitely Although I always hate their dialogue wheel. I hate their dialogue wheel so much. <laughs> I always will. Anything where you have to choose a bit of dialogue and then your character says something entirely different with an inflection that you never intended pisses me off. Like, hang on, I'm supposed to be playing a role here. Let me choose the role. And you see a sentence that's perfectly innocuous. 
And then it, t- like, uh, L.A. Noir as well. Yeah. Like, you picked doubt, and he goes, you filthy commie! I'm like, <laughs> I didn't mean accuse. I just meant, you know, doubt. Express something like, perhaps I don't believe you. <laughs> Those are different things. Yeah. Like, The Witcher does it a little bit, or The Witcher 2, rather. Mm. Does it a little bit, in that it's a different phrase from what you chose. But it almost always has at least the same inflection. Yeah. Because previously, like, things like Baldur's Gate... If it was going to be angry, it would say in little square brackets at the beginning, angry, and mm. then the sentence. So at least you know this is going to be an angry phrase. Mm. But Mass Effect's stupid dialogue wheel doesn't do that. You just know that. And also, the way it's set up so that the top right means the renegade thing, and the bottom right means the paragon thing, and then the, the option in the middle, all on the right, mm. means give me more information. Yeah. Or, sorry, no, it means progress the story or something. Um, that also takes the dialogue factor out of the role play a bit because you just instead of trying to have a conversation you just wind up going i want to be good now i want to be bad now mm, absolutely and not oh yeah i also totally left out knights of the old republic ha <laughs> those other oh. oh. they were amazing that's what i was playing in the early in the mid to early 2000s oh for god instead like- of jade empire <laughs> how could we forget about knights of the old empire or old republic even um, yeah. Although to be fair, like I've never played Knights of the Old Republic. Oh well, actually have, but like only for about ten minutes on PC. Otherwise, it's, I just can't play Knights of the Old Republic not on PC. I was not without one the hard drive crashing because now it seems like it'll crash every time I play a game. And two, oh dear. And two, I can't play with keyboard and mouse. I just can't. I have to play something with a controller. That's how adapt I am to consoles these days than I am PC. It's not that hard to click on stuff, dude. I know, I know, but like, <laughs> I just feel so at home with a controller in my hand. See, we're basically opposites. You love a PC, and I love console. Well, there are some games that are better off. Not, well, I mean, there are some games that you can only play on controller, like Bit Trip Runner. Like, cause the speed, once you get to, I'm, I'm not very good at Bit Trip Runner anyway. But once you get to stage one, level 11, it becomes so fast that if you're using a space to do one of the commands, you just do not have enough time for the for, to press the space bar, have it rise up and press it again. It just, mechanically, it's not good enough. Mm. So there are things, but also some games, like Don't Starve, I play on PC and on PS4, and sometimes you just want to sit back on a good sofa and chill out. Hmm. You know? Fair, fair, that's fair. What uh, led out to you creating the average game? We're talking about the backstory for that. Uh, that was way back in 2005. I was reading British... I sort of was sort of reading British websites about games. And they were publishing these long-ass boring reviews. What? what, what I mean, you'd go to Eurogamer mm. and you'd get like a 2,000-word review. And like the first 800 words would be something else entirely. Like some freaking anecdote that then wound up bearing very, very little resemblance to the actual game. And I didn't, never wanted to be the person that skipped to the end and just looked at the score, because that doesn't tell you about the game. But at the same time, I didn't want to wade through freaking 800 words of some bollocks about some twit's life that I didn't care about. (laughs) So instead, I thought, fuck it, I could do better than that. Set up the average gamer. And the other reason for it, and yeah, we started out with very short reviews, which, like, we'd start with a question... What is the game? Is it fun or not? And is it worth the money? And answer those three questions. And then the be- main bulk of the review would be why. And that would be maybe 200 words, 300, 400, something like that. Now, I sort of moved away from that recent, well, in the past few years, because I started taking on new writers about three or four years ago, and they didn't seem to get along with the format. Mm. They wanted to, like, write loads and loads of words, and every time I take on a new writer, I have to cut down what they're saying. Like, no, no 1,500-word reviews unless you have a very good reason. <laughs> like, you know, it's the kind of game that has a single player and a multiplayer mode, and they're quite different. Mm. In that case, yeah, okay, you can justify maybe 600 words here and 600 words there. But for the most part, no. If you can't get your point across in less than 800 words, mm. I'm going to cut it down for you. <laughs> but yeah, the other reason for setting up the average gamer was that I play very different games to my boyfriend. So if I want to talk about some aspects of Fallout 3, for example, he wouldn't have any frame of reference for it. So first I'd have to go off and explain, oh, it's this post-apocalyptic game, blah, 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 blah. And then I can get onto the awesome story that just happened. Or 
I could skip all that and just write it out for the internet, and people who like it will find the website and think I'm amazing. Hurrah! <laughs> that that was the dream at the time. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be fair, dreams are fleeting in sorts uh, in 2005. They can come about real easily, especially if you're in the games mm-hmm. industry. So that's kind of when yeah. I, that's when I kind of started out uh, with um, my own website, and like it was four years later down the line that. You know, I joined VD twenty four seven, but before that, like when I was doing enthusiast stuff, when I had my own site on enthusiast stuff, I I kind of get gave writers who were doing reviews no more than fifteen hundred, because like I, I I was on the kind of the long form stuff, like as long as it made a point and it made sense, that's fine. Just don't go spend five six hundred words on like like you say some long ass anecdote talking about yourself yeah like yeah. like some long ass anecdote that doesn't make sense within the review as long as it like I don't mind 1500 word reviews as long as like like you said don't have an 800 word anecdote on such wanky bullshit basically yeah if you're drawing a parallel between say walking through a park late at night and playing Silent Hill mm. fine great but if you're just talking about how you walk through a park at night and then this hilarious thing happened and, oh, video game, no, fuck off. To be fair, I, ha- I have been guilty of, like, doing that once or twice in, a, in the enthusiast days. And thinking back on it, I just go, nope, nope, nope. Yeah, nope. I roll. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what a noob. Oh, I hate reading my stuff back. Sometimes I link something, I'm like, oh, yeah, I made really good points about that six years ago. And I go back and, yeah, I did make a really good point. But my God, I could not write. Like ten years ago, like when I when I did start out as an enthusiast, oh my god, I could not write for the life of me. I was so <laughs> shit. This is the god's honest truth, and I can't believe I'm saying this now for everyone here. I was so shit at spelling, punctuation. It yep. was horrible. Like seriously, man. Actually, no, I could always spell punctuation. However, I would definitely do the whole like four line sentences. Like, yeah. No, you only get to use and as a conjunction once. I mean, like, honest to God... I certainly don't go and and but. No, <laughs> new sentence. It's not that hard. So these are, these are the lessons I drill into my writers now. I mean, to be fair, like, I didn't really have that great of an English teacher in secondary school. Um, I can honestly say, like, Pat Garrett was probably the best English teacher I ever had. No, in terms of grammar and structure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, they're not very well taught in school, or at least in my school they weren't either. Like, we had English literature, we had English language. Oh, yeah, like... But yeah. I barely remember the English language lessons. Mm, like, obviously, back here in Northern Ireland, because, like, obviously, me and you, we come from Ireland, although you were growing up in Singapore. But, like, here in, like, Northern Ireland, like, in secondary school, honestly, we kind of had both English language... Uh, sorry, not English language. It was kind of a mix of both, really, to be honest. Language and literature. Yeah, so to speak. Yeah, I did GCSEs, or in my case it was IGCSEs, which are like the international version, Uh, which basically means they don't use references like Lotto or the National Lottery, because people in Singapore don't know what the hell the National Lottery is. Like, the standards are the same. But, yeah, they did. I think it was my year where they started to combine them. And by combine them, I mean they just basically dropped any kind of language and grammar. Like, you did, you know, you did poetry, and they tell you about the structure of poetry and iambic pentameter and all that stuff. I think that was supposedly language. Mm. But it wasn't anything practical that would help you write a decent essay. Mm. Or, you know, write a decent article. Tell a bloody story. <laughs> um, but but going back quickly to The Average Gamer, um, you've done very well for yourself. You won a uh, GMA a couple of years ago. Or last, last year? year? It was last year, sorry. sorry. Oh, it was bad. only last year. Oh god! It's still it's still the year of the average gamer. I will have you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it will be forever because they've dropped the games blog category. Uh, yes, they have. That's right. I know. We can never fall from grace. It's amazing. <laughs> Unless you know they bring it back next year. Oh. Grim Fandango, like, what kind yes. 
drew you towards Grim Fandango? Because like you were saying at the time, uh, at the start of the, the show, how you were in the, the LucasArts point and click stuff. But so, was yes. there anything else at the time like kind of drew you to it? Nope, it was very much, this is another LucasArts adventure game, and I like LucasArts adventure games, therefore I will play this game. <laughs> that said, I never played The Dig, which was, I think, a previous adventure game by LucasArts, unless that came out afterwards. But yeah, like, it started from Indiana Jones. Mm. You know, Indiana Jones is a movie. Mm. I was a kid, I loved the movie. My dad came home with the game, he's like, ah, oh, this is fun, yay. And then we got The Dig, which I, I played but never finished, and Full Throttle, which was amazing, mm. and Grim Fandango, which is just... Bloody fantastic. It was mm. one of the early 3D games. Mm-hmm. And instead of being a point and click adventure, you'd walk around with a numerical keypad, pretty much driving our protagonist, Manny Calavera, kind of like a tank. Mm. But, you know, it was early days then. We didn't have mouse control, really. Mm. I mean, PC gaming would have been very foreign uh, to me at that time, considering I was what? Six. No, not <laughs> six. Three. <laughs> uh, seven at the time, considering Grim Fandango okay. came out in 1998. So I don't, all I played at that time was just, I was a year into the PlayStation 1, like, getting that, so uh, that's what I was kind of playing at the time. Ah, uh, yes. I didn't really play that many point-and-click games uh, in my childhood, like, besides something in school, but, like, the first kind of point and click I ever played was more recently, and that was The Walking Dead. Ah, yes, yes. Um, but interesting. But, yeah, but we'll, we'll we'll come back to that. I'm sure at some point. Um, like, what was it that kind of you loved about Grim Fandango? Like, what were the elements that you? Uh, it was a very about? very different story, a very different setting, because it's mm. set on the Mexican Day of the Dead. Hmm. And whereas everything I'd played up to then was like, oh, high fantasy elves and all that kind of thing. Mm. Or Star Wars or mm. um, Indiana Jones and so on. I mean, and, and The Hobbit and various things like that. This was, you're playing Mexican funereal puppets mm. in the style of film noir. Yeah. In a sort of detective thing with, I mean, the, the voice acting is incredible. Mm. The characters are brilliant. It's got... Is it Tim Schafer? Yes, yeah, it's, it's Tim, Tim Schafer's yeah. bizarre think, humour. And think, the whole thing just looks fabulous, even playing it now. Like, I, fi- I finally got it working on my PC today. Hooray! <laughs> and even playing it now, it's still, yes, it's low res, but it still looks great. Mm. And like Polygons I, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of one of... I don't know if this was one of the first, but it was like one of the very few games at the time that kind of implemented that kind of noir setting for it as well. You had Discworld Noir as well. And I'd play... Discworld was another adventure series that I played because I love the books. I love the ter- all Terry Pratchett books, Neil Gaiman as well. is one of my favourite authors. Mm. And, yeah, there were three Discworld games. Two of them are point-and-click adventures. One of them was Discworld Noir, and it was a very much grittier, darker version of any kind of Discworld thing. Mm. But that was very much more a classic detective going around the dark streets of Ankh Morpork. Mm. I mean, my overwhelming memories of it are that it's grey and black with a little bit of yellow, which is probably not what the game really looks like. But Grim Fandango was colourful and shiny and generally awesome. <laughs> And like I, colors, I, I like colors in games. <laughs> who doesn't? People who make Call of Duty—that's who doesn't. And Battlefield, I guess. Battlefield Orange. Ba- ba- well, Battlefield Lens Flare Orange kind. Yeah. Because like you'd be hard pressed not to find a lens flare in Call of Duty. <laughs> um, I've only ever played one Call of Duty game. What was, was that? Right. A friend left Modern Warfare Three round my house once. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was. I only played the, the single player because uh, well. I'm. I am. I have not grown up with a controller in my hand. I'm not a freaking headshot ninja. I cannot. I can barely shoot straight with a controller even now, despite the fact that I've been allegedly practicing since you know Gears of War. Uh, but that was a great thing about Mass Effect. It was a really good introduction because they had that whole mechanic where if you chose a soldier, mm. then you had a much tighter grouping yeah. with your shots. 
Or if you're me and you chose a person who yield, wields biotics, you could mm. just stand at the back and like throw freaking superpowers everywhere. It was great. Yeah, I, like, I get very annoyed when people describe Mass Effect as a shooter. Would you be mad if I said I was one of them? It's not a fucking shooter. What is wrong with you? <laughs> you choose to play it as a shooter, but that yeah. doesn't mean it's not an RPG that allows no, you to no, no, play no. in different methods, which include never actually shooting a gun. Like I, I kind of. Like I chose my character, my uh, I chose my femship to be a, a soldier, and I know yeah, the series. Absolutely, you can play it as a shooter. Yeah, but that's, that's what, not yeah. what it is as a whole. No, I know, I know. That's that's what I was kind of trying to say. Cause, like I I yeah. I play it as a shooter, but I don't see it as a shooter, so to speak. I'm ju- I'm just getting my yeah. words wrong. That's basically what I mean. Well, but, I also complain to people who call Zelda or RPG, so, you know. You know there are people... A lot who, of people are wrong in my book. There are people who <laughs> call it an RPG. Yeah, I know. They're wrong. <laughs> there are no RPG elements. Um, like, yes, you're playing the role of Link, provided the role of Link involves doing exactly what Link has been predestined to do. And only using the weapons that Link has been predestined to use to defeat this boss. There's no role choice there. Although, the next Zelda is going to be open world. Or open world I know, class. that could be really interesting. So, or it could just be like, oh, well, the world is open, but you still have to go things in this order. Ah, uh, so, true. We'll see how they do that. I'm intrigued, anyway. Mm. Mm. Definitely. But, um, and I'm, I'm only starting out one week after the first time, by the way. So. Yeah, Nick's playing that now. Nick, my boyfriend. Well, technically my fiance, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, he's he's off in the living room playing that now. I've never played Wind Waker. Like I only played Twilight Princess, really. I I've only played. And like I got kind of bored. The only kind of foray I've had in the Zelda series has been uh, um, a couple of hours on Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, and Skyward Sword. And Ocarina of Time was on 3DS, um, mm. and I only played recently uh, Wind Waker. For, I only played it for about 90 minutes at the time, but like I remember being so enamored. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of the word. Enamored? Yeah, that's it. That's it. And uh, I remember it being like, it was lovely, it was wonderful, and I'm going to play more of it um, now if I can, but like I remember playing only something like two, maybe three hours of either um, Skyward Sword. Or getting bored, before. right? Because it's kind of boring. <laughs> yeah, tra la la, kind of, kind of. Whereas, I don't know. I played Minish Cap as well. I forgot about that. I yeah. played Minish Cap. Got oh, bored. And like, not, not Skyward Sword. Um, which one was it? Uh, oh, Twilight Princess. Um, I only played like an hour and a half of Twilight Princess. I was like, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, I got as far as BC Goron, I think, or whatever his name was. Mm. A big ball guy. And with Ocarina of Time of 3DS, I just, like, I have this metric in games. If your game has a spider, bye, Felicia, I am turning mm-hmm. that off. And I saw... How do you play any games then? All games have some sort of horrible spider crab thing. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, like, crabs, crabs I can level. Crabs I can level, level with. Okay. And I, and I kind of had to push... <gasps> did, did you get the bear mod for Skyrim? No, I didn't, and I know I I played Skyrim on Twitch one time. It was uh uh the started game on PC, and I remember streaming it. It was like, and I had to go through the cave, which is full of these spiders. I was like, nope, yeah. nope, 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 fuck that, <laughs> fuck that, fuck this, fuck that. Run I'm away. turning the stream off. Yeah, run away. I'm turning the stream off now. <laughs> Bye. And like, I never installed that mod. I knew, I knew, I I like, I remember reporting on it at the time, but like. I yeah. never got around to installing it, so no, I didn't. I mean, it was kind of shit. Yeah. It was. Uh, like, you still had the spider animation. Mm. So you had these crazy bears that were, like, blobbing around half spider-like. <laughs> so I'm not sure that's any less terrifying, to be honest. No, I guess... Uh, but I, guess I don't have arachnophobia, so I don't know what it is that freaks people out about to, spiders. So. To be honest, like, the only game where I think I've kind of pushed myself in terms of the spider barrier where I kind of had to push on was Uncharted 3. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and that kind of had spider-esque creatures. Like, like if you were in darkness and something like that, you kind of had to force them back with a torch. And I was like, oh, God, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so that so that bit worked really well for you in terms of fear. Oh, so well, so well. I mean, although there are, <laughs> there are games that scared me a lot more than Uncharted Three, but that's a story for another day. Um, but um, going back to Grim Fandango, like we've gone off on a big tangent. Um, like we've talked about what you loved about it. Were there any aspects that? You hated hated about it at the time, or thinking back on it now that you really hate. At the time, no. I like I said, I started playing it today, and I feel like an idiot. I must have been far more intelligent back then, <laughs> when I was like nineteen, eighteen. Because I'm wandering around at the start of the game, going, "Right, I have to get this work order done. How the fuck do I get this guy to sign a work order?" And I'm wandering around. There's like five locations. No idea what I'm supposed to do. I've mm. talked to everyone I can. I've tried poking everything, mm. and I think maybe I'm supposed to get through this locked door, but I have no idea how to get through the locked door. There don't seem to be any hints. Maybe now I need to go back down to the toolbox that I saw before that I couldn't use. Mm. But I haven't checked that yet. And yeah, it is. Like on the one hand, if I solve this puzzle, I will know better. But Right now, I feel very, very lost.、Mm. That may be because it's encouraging you to explore the entire area, and I have, just by being left to my own devices, I have discovered a few rooms where a modern gay would probably just be like, "Perhaps you should go down here and turn left and open the door," which I also hate. Like Batman is very guilty of that. You know the Arkham. Yeah. Asylum I, series. Yeah.、I、like、remember. you look around for about two seconds. And the voice starts going. Maybe I should go up here. I'm like, shut up! I'm looking around. I remember Arkham City being very guilty of this. As much as I loved Arkham City, like I remember that just being very guilty of doing that. Yeah, like just let people turn it off. You know, chill out. Maybe we're looking at the scenery. I mean, yeah. yeah like, like I've I've only been wandering around for about ten minutes. It's hardly the epitome of frustration yet. Oh yeah. But,、uh, oh yeah, but like I'm impatient. We have the internet now. <laughs> yes, I、course. could be watching crap on YouTube. Yes, <laughs> help you out. To be fair, like this is kind of the thing about the internet now, because like obviously you have let's plays and all that there and walkthroughs, and that, and that especially comes in handy when you're playing games like Grim Fandango if you've not played it for a long time, or just stupidly notoriously hard bastard games like Dark Souls. Oh yes, well I get the feeling Dark Souls was designed for that kind of collaboration, was it not? Yeah, I get the feeling it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or did that just kind of grow up? Like, did that community just grow up from it being bastard hard? I think at the same time it, that was definitely the case as well. It was kind of a mix of both, really. Because、mm. like there was still that crowd within Demon Souls as well. Yeah. That was kind of、uh, like obviously Demons and Dark Souls. They're both very different diff- different games, but like there was still that kind of. Community that was there from、uh, the Demon Souls days that could kind of give you an idea. Of yeah, they understand the philosophy behind the design.、Exactly. Whereas me playing Dark Souls, I'm running down a corridor face first into three enemies and getting splattered every time for an hour. Yeah, because I'm impatient and I mash buttons. Yeah, and that's the worst thing you can do in a Dark Souls game. Yeah, I'm the same, and I just think, well. I'm just going to go down here. Oh no! Big ass enemy! They kill me.、Yeah. You died. And every time I see you died now on the screen, I just think you died, motherfucker. <laughs>、uh, At the same time, I do appreciate what that game or the popularity of that game is bringing to video games as a whole now,、mm. which is that hopefully it's teaching developers that you don't have to make your game ridiculously handholdy easy. And I do miss that because. From like I used to play a lot of Tomb Raider or Tomb Raider three and Tomb Raider four, and you just you know you're Lara and you get dropped in a tomb. Well, particularly the beginning of Tomb Raider three was amazing because、mm. you just get dropped on a hill, and you're sliding down a hill, and you, like you go to the cutscene and you go, then oh fuck, I'm in control, and then about two seconds or five seconds later, you hit a tree and die. Oops. And then you realize, oh crap, I'm supposed to jump. I need to actually do things in order to survive. And、yeah. then you could jump over the trees, or you could time it right, and you could jump onto a branch, and that would stop your fall. And then you could have a look round, and it was cool. And then you get to Tomb Raider Legends, which was maybe two thousand seven, I think it was,、mm. 
And it's basically walk down a corridor, wait for the big Y to flash up, and then press Y and you will grapple. Like, mm. That's not problem solving. That's not discovery. And there's that to some extent with the new Tomb Raider. Ye- but yeah. they do mm. still have the exploration aspect mm. if you want to go and collect all the little bits and pieces. And it's a little bit annoying that that's saved, that's kind of reserved for achievement hunters or people who like to collect stuff, because I don't particularly like to collect stuff. Yeah, I understand that. I like to explore, and I like, like in the original war, in Tomb Raider 2 and 3 and so on, you'd find a new path, and you'd go do 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 and then you'd find, like, a rocket launcher. And you wouldn't have that many uses for it, but you'd still have a rocket launcher much earlier in the game than you would otherwise. And it was cool. It would then improve your experience with the rest of the game. Whereas the new Tomb Raider, yeah, okay, I get some little story bits. Or now I found a shiny mask to turn around. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that, mm, yeah, that was pretty much modern Tomb Raider. Although I did, I did enjoy modern Tomb Raider Qu- quite a great deal. Oh yeah, it. like it was. A I liked game. it. It's just a very, very different game. Oh yeah, easily. It was easily. way too much shooting. Too much shooting. I don't. I don't know. I mean, like, I'm trying. Oh, now that I think about it. You might be right, yeah. To be fair... There's I mean, a fuck of a lot of shooting. Yeah, there is. I mean, Like, like there's, there's not that much tomb raiding. In fact, there's barely tomb raiding at all. You walk into a tomb, you poke the shiny thing, and you go, hurrah, I solved a puzzle, and then you open a chest that has nothing in it. Mm. Great. Well, to be fair, like, I, it's been a while since I've played that tomb raider. So, mm. um, it came out, like, two years ago. I know, but, like, I have... The PS4 version as well. That's what I'm trying to say. Like it's been like a couple of months since I've played it, and like yeah. I really, and I've not finished it yet, and I've not oh, uh, I see. reached the ending of that game since I f- and uh, finished it the first yeah. time on Xbox 360. So, um, yeah, it's been a while since I've actually you know finished it. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, the point I was trying to make was Dark Souls proves to designers that you can. Maybe let your people sit around and work things out instead of having to handhold them through stuff like, you know, the Call of Duty single player. Walk mm. down the corridor, shoot all the things, hurrah! Now go left. <laughs> that that is Dark Souls to a T, and probably as well Bloodborne. So, um, you mentioned you only got it today on PC, which kind of leads me to my next question. Um, it's a very rare game, Grim Fandango. Very, very rare. So is it? it like, I got like two copies right here. Really? Well, I think I've got one. I lost the other one actually. I used to have this lovely the original came in a box nineteen ninety eight game oh. that had like this lovely little cardboard fold out set of discs, but I think that's in my parents' house back in Malaysia. But I bought it like four or five years ago, I would think. Oh. On PC. Ah. Oh. No. Oh no, I say four or five years ago. Nope, I bought it in June 2002. Ah. Because I jammed the receipt in the back and I'm looking at it now. Okay, I've had it for quite a while. You might be right. <laughs> no. It's it, rare now, but uh, it's coming out on PS4. Yeah, that's what I was going to come to, but like, at, right now, before that PS4 race, before I get to that, um, like, it's a very rare PC game, like, and it's LucasArts Monkey, I mean. Not, and not to mention, it's like, it is that la, it's, uh, Tim Schafer's last game at Lucas before he went off for a couple of years. Yeah. I'm trying to think, because, were there games, like, after Grim Fandango came out, and just as Tim Schafer found, like, Double Fine, like, were there other games, like, uh, at Double Fine that you played? Psychonauts, etc.? I did play Psychonauts. Psychonauts was fun, yeah. Mm. Um, never finished it because I don't really finish games. <laughs> I finished Grim Fandango though. That's one of the few I have finished. Yay! Um, yeah, Psychonauts is a bit mad, but it also some of the dialogue was fun, but it all just got a. I mean, the whole point of the game was that it was really weird. Like you were jumping into the mental models of these other characters, mm. but that meant that it didn't hold together as a story very well because it was more like here's an overarching story where you're going around the camp Hmm. and now go into crazy world number one lots of mechanics crazy world number two lots of mechanics crazy world number three lots of mechanics like oh okay it's kind of fun it's not bad 
but I didn't really have that drive to finish and find out what happened at the end. Costume Quest is adorable. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I've only played like 10, 20 minutes of Costume Quest, to be honest. I haven't finished it either. Why? But it's so cute. Like their little faces when they're just sitting there going, Ah, oh, it's, it's Halloween. Let's go out in our costumes. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, there was also Brutal Legend. I wasn't a fan of Brutal Legend at all. I have a copy of Brutal Legend sitting in the bedroom somewhere, lying in a drawer. I mean, like, I remember, like, recently when I did one, I was recording one of the episodes for this, I was talking with Ben Corder from Stick Twitters, and, like, his choice was um, The Curse of Monkey Island. Yeah. Uh, and, like... Which I think is the one that James Schaefer wasn't actually involved in. No, he wasn't, if I remember correctly. No, he wasn't. Um, nor was um, Ron Gilbert. So, like, I'm trying to think what what, what I was going to say. Um, um, no, Brutal Legends kind of had that mixed reception. Like, I know Ben, ben was saying to me, go and play it, because I know he loves it, or likes it. I know he like definitely, you know, likes it, but, like, there was kind of this mixed reception around Brutal Legend, because it was kind of perceived to be, if I remember correctly, a strategy game, rather than, you know, kind of... Apparently, well, apparently it turns into a strategy game, like, halfway through. So you start out with this adventure-type bit, and you go off, and you have to rescue all the metalheads from the mines that they're in for some reason. I can't remember why. Mm. And then it turns into this weird tower defense strategy sort of thing, which is fine in itself, but not if you're expecting a Monkey Island style of game. No, I guess not. I really must play it though, just to kind of see how I would get on with it, because... Yeah, you've got it in a drawer. You can use all that time you're saving from not playing Skyrim due to spiders. (laughs) (laughs) I guess not, so, um, yeah, I really should poke it out, I just don't know where it is right now. It's it's actually probably probably in my large container of last-gen games that I probably should fish out of because like there's so much crap lying on top of it right now I'm looking at it (laughs) Um, so yeah it's probably on Steam yeah it probably is on Steam but at the same time like I said I can't really play PC games anymore esque ish even because like if I if I if I try to play a PC game um, that's not really kind of uh, oh your PC keeps crashing does it it's not so much the PC crashes, it's just the hard drive that crashes. Like, I have two hard drives, like, there's the C and D drive, and the D drive is the one is where the games are. And, like, I played Transistor recently, and, like, I, I, was, I managed to play through the amount of time I got to play with it, but, like, after I, you know, finished, or not finished, but after I exited the game, I, the D drive just completely disappeared, and I couldn't open any game or program that was on the D drive. Huh, weird. Yeah. Oops. So, yeah. Um, so, last question then. Oh, on Green Fund Angle, anyways. Um, the remaster. Are you going to pick it up? PS4? Yes, definitely. Probably the easiest. It looks so good. I say it looks so good. I don't care what it looks like. It's an amazing game. And I'd love to see Glottis with, like, proper curves. Because he's, he's this big... He's an amazing character. He's, like, your super happy... Teddy bear style guy, except he's not actually a teddy bear. He's just a bit dopey and big. But he's also made of polygons. <laughs> so he looks a little bit dodgy. <laughs> and like he's talking away, you can kind of see through his head. <laughs> I mean, like, to be fair, like, I've, I've, I've not played Grim Fandango, hence the remaster, hence why it's for mm. people like me. But I remember um, the reaction I kind of had there at E3, going like, oh my god, there, that's Grim Fandango. Even though I've not Why? tried it. I don't know, I just like, oh my god, it was kind of that E3 thing where you think... This is like, this is like Final Fantasy thirteen all over again, isn't it? You get caught up in the hype machine. It is. It kind of Except is. this game is awesome. <laughs> that, that, that would probably be worth the hype. As mm, long, as long definitely. As, as long Everybody as should buy it. <laughs> Even if it's only coming out like three years later and it's made by 900 different studios. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's all right. It's just double fine that's doing it, so. Yeah, it is. So. Working with Disney. Yeah, so it should be fine. Because, like, you know, Schaefer, etc. Unless they'd start to mess with it. They better not. Well, Keep it pure, man. It was so good. It is Disney. 
Yeah. It is Disney. Be more concerned because Double Fine have so far done a crap job with Broken Age. I was so disappointed with Broken Age. I don't care about anyone in it. Like, you're walking around, you go, oh, look, a bird. Hello, bird. And you do a bunch of fetch quests. And like, great, but why am I here and who am I? Yeah, I'm, I mean, yeah. Like, when I was talking to Ben, like, he was saying how he kind of, he, I'm trying to think what he said at the time. He was, he was looking forward to Act 2, but at the same time, there was kind of a trepidation from Act 1. Yeah. Like, it's Act 1. Maybe it sets an amazing scene for what happens in the next half. But as a standalone game, it's not that good. It's not brilliant. It's not like the kind of thing we go, oh my god, you must play it for this, that, and the other scene, because they're brilliant. And they got like a hajillion dollars for it. Like, yeah. What have you spent it on besides like hiring Frodo to do a voice? Woo. <laughs> Stop blowing your money on bloody Hollywood actors and make finish the game. Mm. Mm. Um, fair enough. Fair, fair, fair enough. But, uh, yes, Grim Fandango. Or, in yes. fact, don't even bother and just spend uh, the money on Grim Fandango. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Probably wise, he says, not having played Broken Age or Grim Fandango. mentions what are the other games you would rank among your favorites um obviously there's planetscape torment like talk of your experiences for that then. yes excited, again yeah very cool. story driven built on the infinity engine which is the same engine as Baldur's gate and i think Baldur's gate 2 but it was made by a different company it was made by black isle studios rather than yeah um bioware but, uh, yeah and then black isle pretty much split off to become Obsidian. Yeah. Who made South Park the Game. Well, not South Park the Game. South Park Stick of Truth, which is brilliant, but also very, very different from Planescape Torment. Because Planescape is a very dark, somewhat disturbing story of this guy who keeps dying and losing his memory and Mm. has, has to pick up a collection of party members and friends along the way and learn more about his past. And it sounds very cheesy, but the way it plays out is just good. It's the slow revelation of who everybody really is and what their true relationship is to you because obviously you don't remember anyone. Hmm. So this guy comes along, he's like, hey, yeah, I'm your friend, it's all cool. Like, hang on, wait a minute. I don't remember Is he really? Yeah, and other people going, why are you hanging out with that guy? And you have to figure out who to trust or who not to trust. So there's shades of memento in there as well, a little bit, but at the same time being a very different story. What what other games would you kind of have on your list? Don't Starve is my current favourite. Mm. I have put over a hundred hours into it now across PC and PS4. I'm still not very good at it, but it's from Client Entertainment. It was Kickstarted, I believe, was it? and it's a uh, yeah, I think so. I thought I thought their stealth the their upcoming stealth one. I can't remember can't remember what it was, but I thought it was their Invisible Ink. I think Invis- Invisible Ink. That's it. Yeah, I thought that was the one that was Kickstarted. yeah yeah that as well. But I I'm fairly sure. Don't Starve was kickstarted because if you go into their forums, they keep talking about backer rewards. I'm just checking, no. Um, yeah. But yeah, Don't Starve is a sort of roguelike, but it's a survival rather than your traditional, you know, binding of Isaac, run around and shoot things, or Spelunkies run around and grab and pick up treasure. I mean, and it's not that you generate levels procedurally. You start off with the world, and then the world is generated, and that's it. So as long as you survive you've got that world to explore and you have to figure out how to build your home and just generally not starve, as the title tells you. Yeah, you wake up with nothing. A little like Minecraft in that sense. It's a 2D sort of gothic style art, but it's still a little bit like Minecraft in that you wake up and like you're in this world and it's like, right, go and do a thing. And you wander around and you do a thing and then darkness comes and you go, oh shit, I'm going to die. And the way it introduces new players is that no matter how quickly you died, you get a little bit of experience. And you die a few times, and then you unlock a new character. And that character can change the game completely. Mm. Because, like, you start out with Wilson. Wilson has a beard. You have a sanity level, so as you survive, your beard gets longer, and your sanity level drops if you don't take certain measures to protect it. But Mm. you can shave your beard, and then you feel a little bit more civilized, and your sanity goes up. 
but another character that you unlock. Like, you, you can unlock, I think the next character is a pyromaniac, whose name I can't remember. Hmm. And she's a girl. Hmm. So she doesn't have the beard. Hmm. So you don't have that little method of getting back sanity, so you have to find a different way. Yeah. And she has a tendency to set fire to things when her sanity level drops and she gets a bit nervous. So I played with her. Spent ages building a nice wooden fortress to keep out the hounds, because when you get to about day 11, a pair of hounds starts chasing you, and you need to figure out how the hell to get past them. And, yep, she got a bit nervous, set fire to the entire fucking camp. (laughs) I know. You get that kind of thing happening, but that's it. Every day, you learn a little bit more, and then it changes. And then you learn a bit more, and you learn how to deal with that challenge. And then something else happens. Eventually, you get reasonably good. They're like, yeah, yeah, I'm surviving. I've got food. I've got a way to get food every day. I've figured out how to cook. I'm doing well. And then you hit day 22 or thereabouts, and it's winter. And then if you're surviving on, say, frog legs, well, the ponds freeze up. What do you do now? (laughs) So there's just so much in there that you can do. And like you do, you wind up looking at the wiki instead of figuring everything out, because otherwise you'll just keep dying. And once, like... Getting to day 22 is like a fairly big investment. It's a good few hours. So dying and having to start over is like, oh, no, not again. I have one game now and I'm on day 69. I've made it through the first winter. Jesus. Now I need to start planning good stuff. I mean, like, I... I might just die of foolishness because that's normally how I die. I mean, like, I've only played, like, a couple of hours of Don't Starve. Oh, actually, no, that's not... It's so good. That's, that's... You need to play more. <laughs> In fact, I've only... What are you thinking of, sir? Um, I was gonna say, like, I think I've only played like two hours of Don't Starve, and I just can't get on with it for the life of me. I wish I could. But it's, I say that's about kind of core of the games I say uh, or I play, and I say I wish I could get along with it because everybody else loves it. And it's kind of that same mentality every I have with Minecraft. I wish I could get on with it, but I just can't. Yeah, I get bored of Minecraft. And I recently discovered, like, most people who are still loving Minecraft are playing it modded to hell. So they're not actually playing vanilla Minecraft at all. They're playing this whole different game. Mm. But, yeah, like, Minecraft, vanilla Minecraft is very much, you get past, you survive, and then you go around digging in tunnels and maybe building things. Like, okay, well, that doesn't really interest me that much. Although I did quite like when I I set up on a server with a bunch of friends... And the first thing we did was just build this amazing village on the spawn point. So, like, you'd log in, and then you'd have to go off and feed the cows, Mm. and then kill the cows to get some leather, and then generally help the economy, help our little burgeoning economy grow. And it was cool. But playing by yourself? Nope. Yeah. No. No. Yeah, I was just playing out in the Xbox 360 version. I was like, damn it, I cannot get on with this game by myself. If I had somebody else with me... Great, otherwise, no, not for me. Yeah, that's the problem with the Xbox 360 version. You need your friends online at the same time. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't access a world. Um, but, but why don't you like Don't Starve? I don't understand. It's not... It's not <laughs> I can respect what it does, it's just I can't get on with it. Yeah, but I don't understand why. That's what I'm asking you to I, I define. Mean, it, like, are, are you just bad at it? It's kind of a mix of being bad and... Not holding my attention span for that long, and I know that sounds okay. like a really shitty excuse, but that's the one I'm going to go with. Uh, I get that with Transistor. Uh, People really like Transistor. I find it so boring. I, I love Transistor. I'm like, you walk along the level, and then you get in the elevator, and then you walk along the level again. And you have the little battle thing, and yeah, okay, that's mildly entertaining to string my battle combos together and hit these guys and kill them in the fastest way possible. But then that's the whole game. Rinse, repeat. Like, Uh, even later on, you're still facing the same six enemies you were facing three floors ago. No no spoilers. I'm about about halfway through, I think. So I'm sure sure if if I can get it moved to the drive that doesn't crash on me, I might be able to finish it. Here's hoping. Um... Any other games on your honourable mentions list that you want to bring up? Uh, Papers, Please was my game of the year last year because I hadn't played Don't Starve yet. Mm. But Papers, Please is a really fun, interesting sort of game. Yeah. Even though at heart it's a spot the difference kind of thing, it's not because you have all these moral choices you can make just by the simple action of approving or denying a passport. 
Mm, that, yeah. So I like that very much. Mm, I remember speaking to Lucas Pope earlier this year about Papers, Plays, and like a, I remember telling him the story of when I lost my passport uh, at Gamescom, oh, yeah? um, which which I will tell everyone at some point. But uh, yeah, that was fun. He was, he was basically kind of telling me like how Papers was kind of inspired by the kind of um, like the kind of experiences I went through though in Germany because I remember telling him that story and uh, that kind of intrepid fear you have with security and airports something like that anyways, from, yeah. what, from what I remember off the conversation off the top of my head so yeah they have all the power and you're just some guy yeah exactly so papers please I love, I love it it's very depressing though oh yeah it's very bleak yeah very very bleak very very de- Okay, it has about 20 endings. I did get the almost super happy ending my first time finishing it. Well, technically my second time finishing it. Oh. Uh, because right. the first time I got caught by the inspector doing something wrong. But I like the way that you can just continue. It gives you a little branch. You can continue from whatever day you think you went wrong. So, like, if you get through and you finish and you've done your 31 days and you got an ending that was not ideal mm. because you didn't manage to confiscate enough things or whatever you can then decide okay i think it all started going wrong here when i ran out of money for my family and started making the wrong decisions to keep money for them Mm -hmm. so you can go okay start a new game from day 14 and it gives you your state then and then you carry on and try and make different decisions Mm -hmm. or you can go well okay i did all the happy stuff now i want to see what happens when i don't go and help the guys who are conspiring and you can just go back to say day 32 or sorry not 32 day 22 which is when you started helping them or whatever day it is. Mm. I like that very much as well. You can go off and explore all the endings. If I pressed you for a top three games ever, would you say Grim Fandango, obviously, Planscape, and then... Don't Starve. Don't Starve. So top three games would be Grim, then Planscape, then Don't Starve. Yeah. Two games from 20 years ago, and one from last year. <laughs> <laughs> Fairly recent, although this has come from someone who has The Last of Us as his favourite game ever, so I'm um, one to preach to uh, fire. Uh, so boring. <laughs> Wait, did you just call The Last of Us boring? So boring. You must die. Well, we already talked about the average game before, so yep, that is a games blog. I talk about games, I have other writers who review games, we talk about news. Sometimes cultural stuff. But I also spend a lot of time on Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash weefs. That's W-E-E-F-Z. Where you can watch me being crap at games live. And you can tell me how I'm doing it wrong. But if you say it in an asshole way, then I will probably ban you. So play nice when you're watching other people play games. And you can find me on Twitter, again, at weefs, W-E-E-F-Z. <laughs> Thanks for listening to My Favourite Game. Next week, Alan Williamson on Sonic and Knuckles. Till next week, bye bye.